Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, first, uh, I would like to send the apology from Professor Roland Fletcher. Uh, he would have been here, but he had a bad flu. He really loved to come, but he doesn't want to get you infected. So <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of him. I'm uh, Li Baoping. Uh, I'm a historian and uh, archaeologist, uh, uh, Australia Future Fellow based uh, in the School of Language and Cultures. And uh, um, my field is uh, about Chinese ceramics and their global distribution, uh, history, archaeology, and art history. And that is partly why you see our speaker, Professor uh, Qing Da Su, here, because uh, I studied uh, actually with him in Beijing University, and he is a, a world leading scholar on Chinese ceramics. So now, perhaps. Um, uh, Professor Duncan Allison, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, can uh, introduce uh, Professor Chen Da Su. Yeah. Thank you, Bao Ping. Good evening, everyone. Well, lovely to have you here. Let me just first uh, acknowledge uh, that we're meeting on the land of the Gadigal people, one of the First Nations of Australia. And the, this part of the university campus is built on the land of, uh, of the Gadigal, of the Euro Nation. And I just want to acknowledge uh, elders both uh, past and, and present uh, tonight. Obviously, a very warm welcome to you all. It's a real uh, privilege to uh, be here tonight and to introduce uh, Professor uh, Chin, who we're delighted to have uh, with us and uh, delighted to, for, for Baoping to reacquaint himself with his uh, mentor and teacher as well, of course. Um, we're very proud to, to have a, a vibrant uh, archaeology program uh, at the University of Sydney, and obviously we're very grateful to Mr. Lee for his support uh, of our work in this area over many years and for supporting um, this lecture tonight, among many other things that he has supported at the University of Sydney. So I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Lee and his family uh, tonight uh, as well. Well, uh, Professor Chin is professor at the School of Archaeology and Museology at uh, Peking University, where he received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees. He's a world-leading scholar on Chinese ceramics, as Belping has said, and is the author and editor of, of, of a number of books and, and conference proceedings. He's published over 100 uh, articles, and some of these uh, have been translated into Japanese, French, it and Italian, and, and no doubt English. Dashu has given talks to worldwide organizations uh, such as the School of Oriental and African Studies, the Percival David Foundation at, uh, at London University, the Oriental Ceramic Society, the Osaka Museum of Oriental Ceramics, and the Asia Civilization Museum in Singapore, and of course tonight, the S.T. Lee Lecture at the University of Sydney. Two kiln site excavations led by Professor Chin was listed as top 10 China archaeological discoveries of the year in 2001 and 2009. Professor Chin has led many uh, research projects on Chinese ceramics or archaeology, uh, funded by organizations such as the China Social Science Foundation, the China State Bureau of Cultural Heritage, the China Ministry of Education, and the Getty Grant Program. Some of his recent projects uh, include uh, excavations in Kenya, funded by the Chinese government, which I've just been hearing about now, which are quite, quite fascinating, on remains of Chinese-Africa trade and interactions. And Professor Chin is chief editor of the Bulletin of Chinese Ceramic Art and Archaeology, which is a newly launched uh, journal uh, at uh, Beda. Professor Chin has been a visiting scholar also at a number of organizations uh, around the world, including the Smithsonian, the Singapore National University, and the Chicago Institute of Art. So it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Chin to deliver this year's STE lecture. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for Professor Duncan and uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, it's my honor to present my uh, research achievement here with you and share my uh, new research achievement. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm not usually present in English, so it's a bit hard for me to do that. And also, it's a little bit hard for me to control the time. So if I can present in Chinese, it will be much fluency <laughs> for me. Okay. Uh, today's uh, topic of mine 
is uh, Srivijaya, the interport for Circum Indian Ocean trade. The evidence from Chinese documentary records and material from shipwreck of the 9th to 10th centuries. Uh, so first I will give you some uh, uh, basic knowledge, but it's a uh, new uh, knowledge. You know, China's engagement in uh, sorry, uh, China's engagement in maritime trade was initiated during the second half of the 8th century, developed a rapid. Uh, developed rapidly uh, in the 9th century and attained its first peak in the 10th century. Um, this is not mean that uh, Chinese ceramics, uh, that Chinese ceramics uh, transport to outside China began from 8th century. In early time, small quantity of ceramics were found in the place near China, such as Korea, Korea uh, Korean Peninsula, Japan, and Southeast Asia, especially in uh, Indonesia, which was begin in the uh, uh, which will which will bring by the uh, invoice monks and some other travelers. What I mean here is a real. Uh, uh, what I mean here uh, for the mid of eighth uh, century, it's a real trade. Uh, by a large scale. So now I can show some, uh, you know, early uh, Chinese uh, porcelain found in, the, uh, in in other countries near China. Uh, this piece is, is uh, about the fourth century. It's found in the uh, Korean pen Peninsula, uh, and uh, this is um, this one is uh, found in uh, in North Korea. In in uh, it's the uh, capital of uh, Koryo. Dynasty, and uh, this one is uh, uh, found uh, in a, a king's tomb. Um, it uh, also belongs to the sixth century. So, and also it's uh, found by Wuning Wang uh, uh, Cemetery. Uh, all these are uh, found in uh, uh, Korean, and also this group found in uh, Indonesia. You know, collected by the National Museum of Indonesia, uh, donated by uh, by by this person who is a Dutchman. He uh, stayed in uh, uh, in uh, Jakarta in the early of the uh, 19th century, and uh, he asked the local people to dig the tombs in uh, in Java. Uh, when when he leave for uh, leave back for uh, Dutch uh, for, for for Netherlands. He donated all his collection to the National Museum of uh, Indonesia. So we can see all these uh, uh, pot, uh, pot, uh, ceramics uh, in earth from Java. So this is a group of early pieces. Uh, so uh, and also this. So he he donated about uh, six thousand pieces, and now just uh, two thousand pieces plus is left. Others are stolen, uh, and also this is the piece uh, the early early Celadon uh, your uh, chicken head your found in Vietnam. This is the Southeast Asia, and also this one is the earliest Chinese porcelain found in Japan. It's uh, collected by the National Museum of Tokyo, and uh, uh, it was. Uh, uh, Donated by the uh, uh, Holy Holyoji Temple in Nala, and according to the record in of that temple, this jar was brought by a, a, a sailboat in seventh century. So, I mean, uh, before eighth century, there's a small quantity of uh, Chinese porcelain found in uh, outside China. Um, and uh, the second, uh, I just, uh, I, ha I, ju I just have uh, two points of view. The second is uh, what I mean: the first peak in the tenth, ninth to tenth century is because uh, is uh, uh, is it means that Chinese cargo 
was shipped to many locations around the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, the farthest place it reached was kept about several hundred years until later Yuan Dynasty to early Ming Dynasty, which is the 14th century, and which is the time of Zhenghe navigation. So, you know, uh, in the 9th, 10th century, the Chinese porcelain have already get to the, the further place is East Africa. And uh, until the early of uh, uh, 14th century or late of, uh, 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 early of 15th century or late of 14th century, uh, now scholars believe maybe Zhenghe fleet have got to the South Africa, then uh, beyond the, the, the place uh, the Chinese porcelain reached in the 9th to 10th century. And also, it's in a very large quantity. So this map uh, shows uh, uh, the uh, from the uh, uh, 9th century until the uh, uh, 13th century. So uh, the the Chinese uh, the navigation road. And uh, so at that time, the the furthest place is uh, East Africa in uh, current uh, Kenya and uh, Tanzania, and uh, later. Uh, about Zhenghe's navigation, um, so that time maybe they, they got to the South Africa, the top of the Africa. Um, and also during that time, the, the export Chinese porcelain in, in quite large scale. So here we can see uh, recent years there's a, a very important uh, underwater archaeological achievement. You know, uh, in the end of last century, there's a very important shipwreck found in Java Sea, named is the Baliton Rig or Hita Bottom. Uh, in that shape, there's about uh, 70,000 pieces of uh, uh, 19, uh, 9th century uh, uh, Changsha ware and water. So, and also uh, about uh, yeah, 2004 to 5. There's another shipwreck found also in Java Sea, named is the Cherubin Rig. In that rig, about uh, 500, near 500,000 pieces of antique and altered. So uh, about uh, um, around the 70% seven, of that cargo is uh, Chinese porcelain. It's a ceramic. So it's about uh, 300,000 to 350,000 pieces of their ware in earth from, and water uh, from that uh, shipwreck. So we can see, and uh, sorry, the first uh, shipwreck, is the Baliton rig, is dated as uh, 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 826. And the second one is the Cherubin rig, is dated as 968. So it's always dated. So you can see during that time, the export Chinese porcelain is uh, have a very in, in in a very large scale. So one ship can contain hundred thousand pieces of uh, Chinese porcelain there. So here I I show some uh, object uh, from uh, Hita Bottom, it's Baliton Rig, and uh, this is the uh, Changsha Ware Celadon object, and this is a Northern White porcelain, and this is Guangdong Jia. So now the cargo of uh, uh, Hita Bottom is uh, bought by Singapore. So all things is uh, stored there. When you got to the storage room, you can see, you, you will be shocked because a, a, a huge number of a shell, uh, uh, sh uh, sh uh, shell is uh, the full occupied by the, uh, by the Changsha object and uh, a huge number of j large jars different size, a very large one, a small one, and middle, middle size. Uh, uh, so now, uh, uh, research on this uh, ancient trading system depend uh, mainly on ancient uh, documentary records and archaeological finds. And uh, my, uh, my research presented today uh, is uh, um, vital for the understanding the trading model uh, developed uh, developed for the uh, circum southern China Sea and the Indian Ocean trade. Mm. The first is 
the characteristics of Chinese export item during the 9 to 10 centuries. <coughs> during these two centuries, export uh, commodities mostly uh, comprised the silk items and the ceramics. And the silk, because silk is uh, uh, quite easy to be risked, so uh, 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 only uh, ceramics uh, remained. And so uh, the ceramics have been uh, found in large quantity as a result of uh, extensive archaeological work. On the basis of the investigation and the study of uh, many ancient archaeological sites, we can conclude in summary that the main characteristic of export ceramics in the 9th century was that the, uh, the quantities of a ceramics item being uh, exported uh, uh, had undergone the transition from the small to large quantity. Uh, that is uh, from trying to find out what kind of uh, products were found and by the user of different destinations, gradually set a mode, uh, a mode and uh, ship different products to different destinations. So I can explain this. You know, um, uh, I have uh, did the investigation in a uh, so part site near Cairo, that is the old Cairo. And from that side, the early Chinese porcelain, all of them are with uh, very high quality. And uh, if you go to if you go to Japan, you will find that the Chinese porcelain found in Japan are low quality. So the so the the trader know, so they can they will carry the the highest quality uh, quality object to the farther place, and they change the what they need. So uh, a different place you can find the different quality uh, object. Uh, in, even in the later period in Southeast Asia the export to Chinese porcelain are not so high quality. But in Middle East, in East Africa, you can find all of them are very high quality objects. So because that is the transport for further place, so they, they bring the, the, the high valued object to there. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the period uh, from the 9th to 10th century, export ceramics were produced at the many major kilns in both South and North China. Uh, scholars have uh, demonstrated that the most important of this uh, including uh, of this including Changsha Ware, Yue Ware, Saladang, Changsha Ware is also Saladang, Yue Ware, Saladang, Xing Ware, White Porcelain, and the Guangdong Green Glaze Ware. So this is a so-called major uh, four major types. Uh, in Chinese, they say si zu he. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, I will explain these four types of uh, uh, object uh, uh, one by one. The first is the Changsha ware, manufactured in Hunan, Hunan province, south of China, along Yangtze River. Uh, the port of exporting Changsha ware is Yangzhou port in the north of the Yangtze River. Uh, uh, you can see this is a uh, uh, Changsha ware excavated in the Kilin site, and uh, also this is group of Changsha ware found in Futsat site, uh, uh, that which is uh, where is the old Carol before 12th, 12th century, and uh, also this is the Changsha bowl. Uh, and water from uh, Hita Bottom, uh, the Balitong ship, uh, Tang shipwreck. And uh, uh, also this is uh, from uh, Hita Bottom, and also the group of uh, Changsha ware found in Kenya, in, in, in Shanga site in Lam Lamu Archipelago, Kenya, Eastern Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, the second type is the Yue ware, Green Glades ware, produced in uh, Zhejiang province. The port Yue Wei talk about is uh, Mingzhou, today's Ningbo port. Um, uh, this is the, uh, I believe that is the best uh, Yue Wei uh, during 9th century. Uh, so collected by the uh, uh, Tianyi Ge Museum in Ningbo city. 
And also this group of uh, shirts is uh, inert from uh, Bustad site in Egypt. And this is also now collected in the Edimisi Museum in Tokyo uh, because they conducted excav excavation there. And uh, this is a uh, uh, wear object uh, uh, from uh, Hita Batum, uh, uh, Batu Hitam shipwreck. And also, this is a real wire found in, a, 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 in Earth from a Shanga site in a Kenya. Mm. And uh, also, I just mentioned the, the, the very important shipwreck of a, a Cherubon rig is also found in Java Sea. It contains a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, real wire, mainly a real wire. So you can see all this uh, in Earth uh, from uh, 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 Cherubon rig. Some of them they didn't find through the excavation for the Kilim site and the other site uh, in, uh, on land. So it's a, a huge number and a very colorful UR object. So a, a huge number of uh, uh, UR. And uh, this is uh, used in, uh, uh, in, in northern part and the incense burner and uh, box UR. Hello. This is uh, for drink w uh, wine uh, uh, cup, and the uh, box is bowls. So you can you can understand how many they have. It's more than 300,000 pieces. You were found in this shipwreck, but you know uh, one day there's a there's a story. You know uh, when they excavated the Indonesian police to uh, to come to check them, so they, they threw back about 200 pieces of a broken shirt back to the sea. So now they have uh, about uh, more than 100,000 pieces in uh, now store in Singapore. A big, a huge number. So this is the uh, second, uh, uh, second type. And uh, we can, uh, through this uh, two uh, uh, shipwreck, we can see there's a shift. Uh, uh, from uh, 9th century to 10th century. In the 9th century, mainly export, uh, the, uh, the cargo mainly are Changsha ware. But during 10th century, uh, Changsha ware almost uh, disappeared and mainly are Yue ware. So there's a shift from Changsha ware to, to, uh, uh, to Yue ware. It's not uh, like a uh, uh, scholar believed a couple of years ago, it's a horizontal. But it's uh, shifting from the uh, uh, Changsha wire to Yue wire. And also Xing wire porcelain, which represents a group of white porcelain manufactured area in north of China, such as the early Ding wire in today's Hebei province, and the Huang Ye and the Bai He Kilen in today's uh, Gong Yi city in Henan province, and the Xiangzhou Kilen in the Anyang city, Henan province, as well as, as, well as the Xing wire white porcelain in the uh, Hebei province. And here I show the, the, the map. This is the Ding Kilan, this is the Xing Kilan, and also this is the Gong Yi, uh, Gong Xian Kilan, uh, and also this is the Xiangzhou. So this, this, this group of uh, Kilan sites produce, all produced the, the white porcelain, and uh, it's uh, export during 9th century. And uh, this is a uh, uh, Xing wire from uh, uh, Hita Bottom. And uh, also, this is the uh, white glaze with the uh, green splash. It's also uh, found in a, uh, come from the uh, Balitong Rig. And the uh, tongue dynasty blue and white. And uh, this is the white porcelain uh, in uh, Gong Yi City, Bai He, uh, he Kilan site in Gong Yi City. So uh, this is the lar largest group in the white porcelain of that time, and the green glaze, this is the found in the uh, Kilan side. And also there's a green glaze with a copper blue decoration. And this is also, uh, you know, uh, people said, um, so this is a, a typical design uh, of uh, Western Asia and the Middle East, you know. Um, and also uh, green glaze uh, with the uh, Character of a Ying, so it's the usually found in a uh, usually found in a Xing Kilan site. So 
so. And also I just mentioned the Xiangzhou object is represented by this by this uh, UR because this is found in Handan city near the the Kilan site. Um, so and uh, uh, we can see during that time uh, northern uh, the Kilan in the northern part in the, the southeast and also in the uh, in the south produced object uh, were export to to the uh, uh, to the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, the, the countries uh, around the Indian Ocean. And uh, this is a uh, so-called Guangdong uh, Celadon Ware because uh, there's a, a few uh, archaeological work been did, been done uh, in Guangdong, so we don't know exactly the Kilan site, but I just know uh, some Kilan site produced a, a, a green glazed object during 9th, 10th century. This is uh, uh, Guangdong Celadon Ware from uh, Baditong Rig, uh, and also this kind of jar. So uh, it uh, keep producing until uh, 17th, 18th century. Uh, so one the time into 10th century, white uh, uh, with the decline of the Changsha Ware, the Yue Ware from uh, Zhejiang province becomes the most important export posting as well as with small quantity of Fanchang White Ware in Anhui province and uh, Xinmi white ware in Henan province replaced the so-called Xin ware. So now uh, you can see this is a uh, uh, Yue ware I just uh, uh, saw uh, from Cherubon Rig rep uh, replaced the Changsha ware in the 9th century and. Uh, And also, uh, this kind of white porcelain is uh, in southern China, in Anhui province, it's the so-called Fanchang ware replaced the Xing ware. It's northern white porcelain. And also this, this vase probably made in uh, Xinmi in Henan province, near the uh, big canal. So uh, during 9 to 10 centuries, there were many uh, there were many ports in the uh, coast of China engaged in maritime trade. The most uh, important ports for export trade in this period were Yangzhou, Mingzhou, its current Ningbo city, and Fuzhou and Guangzhou. However, these ports were not necessarily uh, involved the exporting uh, commodities directly to all destinations and uh, there were a number of interports in the Indian Ocean trade circle. Cargo from ports of China could be transport transported firstly to this uh, interport and uh, loaded onto ship coming from other parts uh, of the Indian Ocean circle uh, for onward shipping. One important interport in 9th to 10th century was most probably uh, Balitong, uh, the capital of the uh, kingdom of Sri Vijaya on the island of Sumatra. So uh, here is uh, Palambang, the capital of uh, Sri Vijaya. Sri, Sri Vijaya kingdom is in the Sumatra island. So this is the location. It's uh, near the, the mouth of the Malacca Strait. Uh, okay. Second is the uh, ancient record of the maritime trade, uh, maritime links, and the close uh, relations between China and uh, Nanhai. Uh, so in in ancient time, Nanhai means from Kalimantan to the west. All that countries uh, uh, in uh, around the the Indian Ocean, we uh, in, Ch in ancient Chinese uh, literature material said it's a Nanhai cities. Uh, uh, Nanhai countries. <coughs> so uh, before the Tang Dynasty, there were few documentary records about uh, early shipping activities. After Tang Dynasty, fuller record of maritime trade appeared. So there, there are three of them are very important. So the first one is 
呃《易经》。It's a 大唐西域求法高僧传。It's a tale of the outstanding monk seeking Buddhist sutra in the western region during the Tang Dynasty, written by Yi Jing. And uh, uh, so, according to the uh, uh, according to uh, scholars' uh, statistics of the uh, statistic. Uh, this book recorded the expedition and the ex experience of, uh, of a Buddhist uh, uh, pilgrim and a scholar to the Nanhai uh, uh, and the Indian uh, between the year 641 to 691. Within these 50 years, 57 monks uh, 57 monks, uh, 57 monks made the journey as part of a 33 separate uh, expedition. Among those uh, journeys, four persons uh, traveled by the unknown road. Uh, well, 18 persons in 12 group uh, traveled to India by land, and uh, 34 person in 20, 21 groups travel by sea, especially, uh, uh, respectively. Uh, the ratio of a sea to land voyage was uh, 2.3 to 1, and the ratio of a number of persons traveling by sea to those traveling by land was uh, 1.9 to 1. Uh, so this means uh, uh, people usually know uh, Xi Yu Ji, that is a very important novel uh, during ancient times. So every people know the uh, the Tang Xuanzang. He went to India through the the, the land. Uh, uh, but you know more more monks went to uh, India through the sea road. So that is the uh, the fact, and uh, also. Yi Jing himself, himself went to uh, uh, India by sea and uh, studied the Buddhist uh, doctrine there for more than 10 years. On his return to China, he had stayed in Sri Vijaya uh, for eight years to translate the Buddhist uh, sutra and the writing. So, and also uh, he has a story. He, when he, uh, before he back to uh, to, to the home, the first year he went to Canton first, then go back to uh, to Palembang to prepare. So when he back to uh, uh, to the Tang Dynasty, the Emperor Wu Zetian outside the Luoyang to meet him. So actually, this person is uh, more important than Xuanzang, but you know because he linked with the Emperor Wu Zetian. This is the only uh, lady emperor in the Chinese history. So the later scholar pay no attention to him. But actually, Yi Jing is, is one very important monk uh, during the history of a Chinese uh, uh, Buddhist. So up, uh, and also through this, we can know during that time, Plambang is, uh, is, has a very important position during that time. So Yi Jing, Stay there for uh, for translating and the writing. So obviously, the sea road the sea road will also great, uh, greatly developed when land transportation was uh, forming in the second half of the seventh century. So every people know the Silk Road. Uh, we mean the the desert road, but actually, in the same time, the the, the sea road is also quite developed during that time. Um, but, you know, uh, in the seventh century, uh, uh, so I, I just, I didn't translate this uh, Chinese uh, 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 letter to record. So uh, during early time, the relation with uh, uh, Western uh, in the, the country around the Indian Ocean is uh, private 
not officially. So in the uh, uh, middle of the uh, uh, 8th century, when Emperor Xuanzong asked the, the foreign country to the Minister of uh, Foreign, uh, the, uh, uh, the Minister of uh, uh, Foreign Minister, uh, that uh, Hong Lu Qing, uh, the, the head of uh, Hong, Lu, uh, Hong Lu Si, Wang Zhong Si, so he, un he just uh, count about uh, 10 plus countries. So that means that before uh, second half, uh, before the middle of 8th century, there's a very few official link with the, uh, uh, with the other countries. But after then, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, a full, there's a more relation by the uh, official link. Uh, these two records suggest that although the ancient Chine Chinese uh, already had a close maritime connection with India and Western Asia and even countries as far as, as far away as the Middle East, most of the connecting among uh, individuals were in frequent, uh, in frequent before the full flourishing of the later Tang Dynasty. Only during the later stage of the Tang, that is the 9th century, do official record about foreign contacts gradually increased, as recorded, for example, by Jia Dan, who was a, who was appointed as the Premier Minister in uh, 793 of the reign of uh, Emperor De Zhong, of the Emperor De Zhong. Uh, in the later Tang period, that the second half of the century to ninth century, all important official records about foreign contacts come out. This, uh, one of the most important records is the Huang Hua Si Da Ji. It's the road lead abroad from China, written by Premier Jia Dan. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this book has been lost. The record about the road were mainly, uh, were mainly retained from the quotation of the geography in New History of Tang Dynasty, Xin Tang Shu, Di Li Zhi. And uh, so Jia Dan is a very, very famous uh, geography. So he wrote a lot of uh, a book about uh, geography. So here, one, two, three, four, five. So this uh, uh, from Xin Tang Shu, Yi Wen Zhi, they recorded many books written by Jia Dan. But Huang Hua Stati leave a short part in, in Xin Tang Shu. So, uh, from Huang Hua Si Da Ji, we know there were seven abroad roads from China recorded by Jia Dan, five of which were land road, and the other two roads are the sea road. The first one is road from Zhengzhou, which is the uh, uh, Shandong Peninsula, uh, to the Korea Peninsula, and also the second road from Guangzhou to Hai that is uh, mean uh, foreign countries in the ocean refers to the kingdom around the ocean from southern China Sea to the Indian Ocean. Uh, so, uh, the maritime road from Guangzhou to Haiyi mentioned by Jia Dan in Huang Hua Si Da Ji uh, specified the stage of the road directly the uh, the time to take to travel this distance from Guangzhou to Baghdad uh, in Iraq. In Iraq, so uh, here I show this uh, uh, this record. You know, this is in Chinese. Uh, from this, uh, okay, from this uh, uh, record, they will point uh, from one one point uh, one point of place uh, directed to to some place, uh, like uh, uh, directed to the west, uh, to the uh, southwest, and for how many days, and to another place. So it's a very, uh, in, uh, very in detailed. So I try to translate some of them like this, but it's a, a bit hard. So, so uh, now we can show the, the map. Uh, this is uh, from Guangzhou, then uh, to the point I, 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 I point here, so this is the first uh, 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 first part of Guangzhou to Baghdad. So from Guangzhou 
to Balaka Street uh, to the uh, Palambang, named as the Fo Shi Guo, that is the Sri Vijaya. Uh, this is the first part. And uh, from here, uh, the road uh, separate to two directions. Uh, the, the first one is sitting to the east, to uh, east of Srivijaya for four or five days. It arrived in Heling Kingdom, that is uh, in, in, in east of uh, Java Island. So the largest island in the sea, this is uh, translated from the record. And uh, uh, the first one is uh, to the east, and the second one is to the west through the Malacca Strait. And, uh, so this is a map you can see from uh, uh, Fo Shi Guo. The first road is uh, to the Java, and the second road is uh, uh, across the Malacca Strait to the west. Uh, so I uh, so all the uh, blocked by by red is the place they point out. So you can see this this part is uh, from. Uh, uh, Palambang in Sumatra to the Sri, uh, Sri Lanka now. So in, in, that, uh, uh, in that time we, we, we see that country is a lying, lying kingdom. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, there's a small, uh, small part, it's uh, from uh, Palambang to Srivijaya. And uh, uh, the, the last uh, part is uh, from uh, uh, Sri Lanka to the uh, uh, to the Persian Gulf. Uh, from today to Sri Lanka, travel along Indian, the western co western coast, uh, they could reach Ula Guo, Ula Guo, uh, in uh, in in current ba Basra Basra at uh, uh, Alfred, uh, Alfred River mouth. Then transfer to a small boat to reach Baghdad. So all this trip takes uh, 87 days from Guangzhou to Baghdad. So we can count the de details. Um, so here is uh, from uh, here, but here is a very scale sheet. You know, maybe take uh, 20 days from this point to that point. But in this, uh, in, 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 the, in the before part, you can see it's uh, sometimes it's uh, just uh, one day on a half day. So here it may be take a half day to another point, uh, one day to another point. So it's a very detailed. Uh, so this map uh, is uh, uh, shows uh, from, uh, uh, from Guangzhou to Baghdad. Road and uh, actually from Sri Lanka, there's another road uh, directly to Red Sea. But you know, this road was known as the coast of uh, East, the Hai Dong An. Uh, road during the Tang period, while the road north, northbound along African East Coast till one reached uh, Persian Gulf, the coast area was known as the coast of West. The so Jiadan made a special effort to record the coast of West Road. So here, I, uh, according to the Jiadan's record, we, I wrote this, uh, this uh, sea road. It's uh, from, uh, 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 from uh, Eastern Africa to the Arab Peninsula and uh, to the Persian Gulf, and uh, uh, linked with the Eastern Road, Eastern Road, and uh, uh, so, uh, this is the detail I don't want to, to see here. And uh, uh, the, the important thing is the far end of the western road. That is, uh, the, the name is the Sanrum. Sanrum. But in, in the uh, scholar have a different opinion about this. And, uh, some scholar believe it's in, 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 in Adan, in Oman now. But most of the scholar believe it's uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, one scholar believe it's a direct salam because also Sanram and the salam is uh, quite, quite near, the pronunciation is quite near. But uh, most of the scholar believe 
it's com uh, it's uh, uh, referred to the Eastern Africa in current Tanzania or Kenya. Mm. And uh, uh, the, the, the third important uh, record is uh, it's a Yoyang Dagu written by Duan Chengshi. Uh, in this book, he, he points out many countries in North of Africa. It's, uh, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, about six countries. And some have a detailed description. But this, this uh, uh, record is not uh, uh, concerned with today's topic, so I didn't translate it. <coughs> And the Jadan's document has the most detailed record of the 10th to 10th, uh, 9th to 10th century maritime road. For the same period, there were also ancient texts written by Persian and Arabic scholars. So there's uh, three important uh, Arabic, uh, uh, there are three important uh, uh, for the, uh, for the same per period, there are also uh, three important ancient texts written by Persian and Arabic scholars. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, this one, blah, blah, blah. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, translated into Chinese as Dao Li Bang Guo written by Hu Er Da Zi Bi He uh, in uh, eight, 846 to 885. Uh, and another uh, important book is uh, unknown author written uh, the name I said, you know, this is Arabic, I could not pronounce. You know, uh, uh, translated into Chinese uh, is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 dated to the period from the mid 8th century to early 9th century. And the third one is uh, also uh, uh, written by uh, Masudi. Um, Named as uh, Huang Jin Tao Yan. You know, we, we know there's a three important uh, Arabic uh, textile. So this is the map we try to did. You know, uh, this line is about Huang Hua Si Da Ji, written by Jia Dan, the, the road uh, he take to Baghdad. And also another, another two line is uh, about uh, Arabic text uh, 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 letters and material. So, we can see uh, uh, Jia Dan's uh, 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 record is very detailed before the Malacca Strait and very sketchy uh, in the uh, beyond the Malacca Strait. But in the uh, Arabic uh, uh, authors' uh, works, it's very detailed in the western of Malacca Strait. But only one book recorded the road uh, east of Malacca Strait. So this is uh, uh, so. Uh, if we combine the information from Japan's document documents with with that in the Arabic writings, it become clear that during the 9th to 10th century, there were three trading circles around the Indian Ocean between China and the Southeast Asia. Between uh, uh, first one is uh, uh, from China to Southeast Asia, that is Malacca Strait. The second one is uh, between Southeast Asia and the Arabia, Arabia and the Persian Gulf. The third one is between the Arabian area and the first uh, and the East Africa. Uh, Sri Sriwijaya and the Basra were the two key points of the trading inter, uh, interchange that connected the three circles. So. This is the short uh, uh, three trade circle. Uh, so in ancient time, uh, sea going shape was so depend on monsoon and the direction that it take about two years to sail for the round trip from China to Baghdad. It was a long trip for a trader, and therefore maritime ship did not always travel the entire road from China to, Arab, to Arabia and the Persian Gulf. So this is a show of the monsoon.
there's the, the second season. So instead, instead Srivijaya serves as a key trade, key trading interport for traders from both sides of the Indian Ocean. Merchant ships from both China and the Persian Gulf ended their voyage in Srivijaya, uh, where they loaded and unloaded their merchandise before making return return trips to their home country. So this, the the letters of evidence for this come for three resources. Three sources. The first, Jiadan's uh, Huanghua study documented the maritime road between China and the Malacca Strait in such a detailed level that it serve as a daily and sometimes even a half day long of activity of, of activities. But the, uh, but the detailed record of the voyage beyond the Malacca Strait were very sketchy, and the uh, activities were only documented every five or six days, and uh, some, somewhere as far as uh, 10 or 20 days. Similar documents recorded by Arabic, Arab uh, geographers and travelers were very detailed for the mar uh, maritime road west of the Malacca Strait, but less so for the voyage east of Malacca Strait. <coughs> One can therefore uh, deduce from these documents that the people, mainly uh, diplomats, tra uh, traders, and the sailors, were whom written the literature seldom travel the entire road mm, because they just uh, need a sail to the link point of two circles where they, can, they could finish their trade act, uh, activities. Therefore, none of them could provide a comprehensive detail of the entire voyage. They could only provide details, um, accounts for the one of the two legs of the journey, either west or, west or east of the Malacca Strait. You know, uh, one Jiadan write his uh, book of uh, Huang Hua Study. He interview many person, some uh, di diploma diplomatic uh, uh, um, ambassadors, some traders, and uh, some foreigners come to China. So, uh, but these people just uh, know the, the detail of the the sea road uh, east of Malacca Strait. But you know. Uh, they, they, he know the west, uh, the the road west of Malacca Street. Uh, it's a, it's a second hand because this uh, this trader hear the the road from other traders, so it uh, could not be very detailed. So this is the first. So this is also show that map. You know, uh, Jiadan is very detailed in this part, and the uh, Arabian uh, uh, writers is very detailed in this part. And second, China, uh, uh, China and uh, Srivijaya had a very close relationship, according to documentary record from uh, Song Shi Song Dynasty history. Uh, the record of uh, uh, the record of uh, Sambodia. Uh, Sambodia is a, a, a early name is uh, Srivijaya. Later, the name is uh, in China. In China, is uh, Sambodia. Uh, the Cambodia Kingdom, also known as Srivijaya in the early years, sent official um, <coughs> invoice to to pay tribute to the Song court on the total of 14 occasions in the period from uh, uh, 960 to to 1008, uh, every averaging one tribute mission uh, every three years. And uh, this reflected the close re official relationship between the two kingdoms. And uh, uh, this is a this is an official document, so recorded uh, 14 of of this uh, visiting. And also uh, another uh, another book uh, said, Southern Sea ship, a foreigner ship, 
sitting on Nan, that is the current Vietnam and the Guangzhou yearly. So that means if the same ship come yearly, that means he, that ship could not go to the, uh, depending on the monsoon, they could not go to the Persian Gulf. They have to go to the uh, Malacca Strait and return. So they can come every year, once a year. And uh, there's a, an, another later uh, record, Zhou uh, Qufei's uh, Ling Wai Dai Da, he said, Samboji was a strategic, strategically located in the south, uh, in the such an important position in the southern South Sea that traders in kingdoms from the east, such as the Javanese or the west, such as the Arabs, need to pass through Samboji in order to reach China. So that means uh, uh, even from uh, 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 Java and also from the uh, Persian Gulf, they, when they, if they want to come to China, have to pass by the Samboji. Uh, And also there's a, a much later uh, record. Um, the, the, the steel of the Xiangying Temple in Putian County, Fujian Province, dated on the eight years of the Shaoxing reign. It's uh, 1138. Uh, it's that, um, <coughs> it's that an, an Admiral uh, Zhu Fang from Quanzhou lead his maritime, uh, maritime trade uh, ships from Quanzhou to Samboji. They sail fast and no much dangers. They made a round trip within a year and profit uh, handsomely from their trading business. People before and after them trade to foreign countries could not uh, compete this uh, profit. So this is uh, quite late. It's about 12th century. Uh, this is uh, uh, in Chinese. Uh, uh, why, uh, why during very late time, there's a, a record about a Chinese ship to Samboji, uh, to the uh, plan bound to do this, this kind of trip? Because during early time, in 9th, 10th century, according to the game series, Chinese did not really do the trade. The, the trade is conducted by the, per, by the Persian and the Arabic. So because the Ch Chinese just uh, need to make the product, they make their profit. And the trade is did by the, uh, by the Persian and uh, also Arabic. The uh, Chinese really conducted the, the sea road trade. It's about uh, 11 or 12th century. It's mainly from 12th century. And third, it was uh, uh, clearly recorded in the both Chinese and the foreign documents that maritime trade at, the, at that time seldom come cross trading products from a single location. <coughs> so uh, according to the record of, uh, from the Song Shi, uh, Song Dynasty history, uh, the tribute item on the Samboji 14 missions I just mentioned before, uh, uh, fr uh, frankly, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, include uh, uh, the object uh, as the following: every Renault Renault home, uh, pearl, uh, Beijing probably the uh, electrum, and uh, frankly, Pelu Xin Lu Xiang, a kind of a sense. Uh, Mustics, uh, uh, Qiang Wei Shui, that's the rose perfume, crystal, crystal ring, crystal boot, uh, this, this kind of things. <laughs> I, I don't, uh, not uh, read it. And uh, what I marked by red is not really uh, manufactured in, in, the, in the Southeast Asia. You know, like a rhino horn, it usually comes from Eastern Africa. And also the Qiang Wei Shui, it's a product of uh, Middle East. And uh, also glass perfume bottle. It's produced uh, around the Mediterranean coast. And uh, date, you know, it's date is uh, 
is a, a, a group in the uh, Western Asia and also Middle East. And uh, uh, especially the important is the Kunlun Nu. Uh, in Tang and the Song period, usually refer to the people come from Eastern Africa as Kunlun Nu. In the ancient Chinese record, there's a detailed describe of Kunlun Nu. They said the people is black, they are very strong, they are very kind, and it's a very suitable for slavery. Uh, it's not really slavery, you know. In, in ancient China, we see slavery is a waiter. It's a waiter, the serve for the masters. It, it's, it's not a later concept of a slavery. You know, so uh, in China, they believe all this kind of object is a it's produced in Southeast Asia. Because uh, Chinese didn't uh, go to the, uh, haven't been to uh, to the uh, western of uh, Malacca Strait. They don't know that kind of object is actually produced in, in the part western of Malacca Strait. So this is a Chinese material. And uh, <coughs> the scholars from uh, uh, Basra, Al Ajit, uh, Jahid, uh, he, he wrote a, pay, uh, a book, uh, blah, 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 like this. It's uh, uh, translated into Chinese as the Shang Wu De Guan Cha. It's a, a view of the merchant, uh, 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 a view of a commerce, view of commerce. He documented a long list of uh, merchandise they imported to Baghdad, and among which he identified this group has uh, come from China. You know, the silk, the porcelain, the paper, ink, subtle, subtle sword, spices, musk, uh, salmon, and uh, peacock. You know, actually, this kind of uh, things is not uh, uh, really produced in China. You know, uh, spicy and the cinnamon and the peacock in China during uh, Song Dynasty, it's very valuable. You know, he, he, uh, Chinese even want to get it from the other part of China, uh, other, other uh, beyond of China. So they could not export this, this kind of object. And also another, uh, another uh, book I just mentioned is Dao Li Bang Guo Zhi. And uh, uh, so there's a part, it's Ru uh, Zhong Guo Dao Li Xu Zhi. The, the road to China, and uh, uh, from uh, so uh, uh, the writer, uh, the author lists also some objects that come from China: the white silk, color silk, fibers, a golden flower uh, brocade, porcelain, and also uh, some drugs, masks. Aloe wood, saddle, uh, mink fur, cinnamon, and ginger. So you can, uh, I believe that I, I brought uh, in red, it, it's not uh, really uh, uh, come from China, it's, it's from uh, Middle East. But for the people in uh, Western Asia and the Middle East, uh, they don't know that it's pro actually produced in, uh, in, uh, uh, in in Middle East, they believe it's come from China. Like, uh, you know, aloe wood, during Song Dynasty, aloe wood is very valuable. Uh, in China, just uh, in Hainan province, produced a, a small sum of uh, aloe wood. But, you know, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, there's a lot of aloe wood. So, so the people in Middle East, they believe that it's produced in China, it's come from China. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, okay. Um, so now we come to the uh, third. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, some scholar, 
Some scholars believe that uh, Sri Vijaya's success came mainly from having a comprehensive administration system to uh, 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 facility maritime trade. And uh, the government uh, uh, centralized all kind of uh, local products uh, such as aloe wood um, and uh, every some tin and uh, uh, cloth oil, etc from island region in the east of Indonesia to Palembang. For the reasons they constructed uh, warehouse facilities to store the goods, uh, merchandise from other regions include uh, ceramics from China, glass perfume bottles from Middle East, and the rose perfume from Persia were also stored in the same warehouse facility. For the people come to trade in this point, and uh, uh, this allowed the trader to catch the monsoon season to return home or move on their next destination, Sri Vijaya, is the main source of the income came from a, a port in uh, entry and the trading, trading fees. And uh, there's a, uh, as the Indonesian scholar said, you know, the method of uh, Sri Vijaya, how to do this, Things is they send their so because the Palembang is uh, about uh, 50 kilometers from the Malacca Strait and uh, uh, beside a river, so they send the soldier to the Malacca Strait to kidnap all the, the, the merchant ship and uh, take them to the Palembang. When the trader come to here, oh, they suddenly found they can get everything they want and they can sell all kind of their things. Then later they they, they intentionally come to the plan bond to do the trade. <coughs> then uh, the third, Sri Vijaya as a, a, a trading center from archaeological um, uh, evidence, uh, archaeological uh, perspective. Sri Vijaya, uh, Sri Vijaya's yeah, uh, establishment as a trading center uh, cost of its uh, unique uh, geographic location. And this trading uh, economy model clearly presents the uh, archaeological materials. Uh, we can uh, also have uh, three evidence. First, uh, ceramics uh, from Changsha Kilan in Hunan province were, uh, were major export item in 9th century. And uh, uh, porcelain, uh, porcelain pieces from Changsha could be found at many sites in, uh, in the Sumatra and the Java, and yet a few have been found in, Indo uh, in Indochina Peninsula along its uh, eastern coast. This confirmed Jia Dan's uh, record that the ship sailing from Guangzhou uh, headed uh, directly towards to the Sri Vijaya did not make a stop along the road in the place uh, like uh, uh, Indochina to engage us uh, in trading. It was only Sri Vijaya, the merchant engaged uh, in major trading. Therefore, they did not do small sum trade in early voyage in one by one stop. A few Changsha were found in the south top of Vietnam which were trade back from Palamba. It's, it's, uh, it's not really uh, uh, deep trade by the ship from uh, Guangzhou. So, you know, they, they from uh, Guangzhou directly to the Malacca Strait to Palamba and not uh, did uh, any trade during on the, on the way to the uh, Malacca Strait. Uh, second, the reason, fi the reason find of a shipwreck in the sea of Baliton with uh, the name as uh, Batu Hitam, which was treated as a typical type of ship constructed in the region of Siraf, Arabia. So, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Michael Flaker did the research that uh, he means this is a typical Arabian ship, and he believes it's on the way back to Arab. It's sunk in Java Sea. Um, uh, so, Changsha boats uh, account for the large 
propo uh, proportion of the fines, and uh, they are in perfect or mint uh, condition, as they were well preserved and kept in large dozen jar produced in Guangdong. So you know, uh, all the Changsha ware found in the Balitong rig, it's, a, it's very shiny, it's well preserved, because they stored inside the jar and seal the moors, so it's not uh, uh, polluted by the sea, by the uh, sea water. <coughs> and, uh, 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 and in which I uh, have yelled uh, over uh, 50,000 pieces of Changsha ware. It's uh, uh, dated as uh, 8, 826. Uh, Changsha both uh, accounted for the large uh, proportion of the fines, and uh, they are in perfect uh, uh, or mint condition, as they were well preserved and kept in the large dosen jar. Uh, from Changsha where, so this is a kit, you know, uh, it's a one, when they did the underwater archaeological, it's like this way. Mm. From Changsha where's uh, production origin and archaeological studies undertaken in uh, Yangzhou, uh, uh, Jiangsu province, it can be uh, uh, I certain that the major export port from Changsha uh, for Changsha Ware was Yangzhou Port uh, in Dong Strait section of the Yangtze River, and uh, the large dozen jar produced in Guangzhou could only be exported from Guangzhou Port itself. Among the uh, 67,000 uh, wares from the uh, Batu Hitam was some white porcelain produced in northern China and the green wares uh, from uh, Yue ware. It's only 200 pieces of Yue ware from Zhejiang province. White porcelain from uh, northern, from north were also loaded and uh, brought from Yangzhou port, but Yue ware left uh, the port from uh, Mingzhou, now Ningbo city. In the past, there was a uh, a consensus among the scholars that uh, after the, the cargoes were loaded onto the battle hitam in Yangzhou, the ship then set to sailed along the Chinese Southeast shore and the code in the, in the port of Mingzhou and Guangzhou to pick up more cargoes before heading to the Southeast Asia. You know, this is a, a northern object and uh, this is the Yue Ware from Mingzhou. So uh, before, uh, sometimes the go scholar believe, you know, Changsha Ware is to take the road to the, through the Yangtze River and uh, uh, load it uh, on the ship in Yangzhou. Then they will stop in Mingzhou just for take 200 of pieces of Yue Ware. And they stop in Fuzhou, they don't know they, what they take. And then they went to, they went to Guangzhou I loaded uh, six, uh, six, seven, uh, six seventy thousand pieces of uh, Changsha ware to store in the Dosen jar, then reloaded it, then towards to the Southeast Asia. It's a, uh, 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 and that is a vessel then uh, stank uh, in route to Java or in the return voyage back to Arabia. If this uh, 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 hypothesis, hypothesis were correct, uh, what it means that uh, the over uh, 50,000 pieces of ceramics uh, which were first loaded on board at Yangzhou and had to offload it on the Guangzhou repackaged and then uh, placed in the large, uh, placed into the large dozen jar before heading to Java. So the stop over, over in Mingzhou was just uh, for pick up 200 pieces of Yue Wire Saladon. This does not sound logical 
and uh, reasonable. So uh, a more convenient and uh, logical uh, explanation was that the Baliton, uh, the Batu Hitam ship actually came from Middle East and was loaded up with goods in Palembang and then sunk on the way it to Heling Kingdom, Java. The cargoes on board the Batu Hitam were brought to Srivijaya by different ships come from Yangzhou, Mingzhou, and Guangzhou. It can therefore uh, surmise that uh, Palembang at, at that time had a huge warehouse to store a large quantity of ceramics. And the third of the evidence, the shipwreck found uh, the shipwreck found out uh, Cherubon. Cherubon is also a name of a sea in uh, Java Sea, Indonesia, exhibit a similar complete, uh, complexity, <laughs> complexity of uh, cargoes. The artifact uh, slaved, uh, slaved uh, from the sunken ship, including uh, 350,000 350, or so ceramics uh, of uh, various uh, kind. Uh, amongst uh, them, green glazed ware from Yue Kilen and uh, export from Ming, uh, and uh, exported from Mingzhou account for the major majority of the ceramics. And the other include uh, okay, uh, this is a uh, Yue ware from a uh, Cherubon rig. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the storage home. Uh, all is a kit uh, bag uh, of the year wear. Uh, then uh, others uh, include a small quantity of uh, white porcelain from Anhui and Henan province. And uh, a large quantity of uh, lead coins uh, of uh, Southern Han Dynasty. It's located in Guangzhou city. Uh, uh, capital was in, in Guangzhou and the uh, unknown quantity of uh, uh, silver ingot uh, in benches of uh, copper mirror and the small, uh, small most uh, ceramics pots. This is the mirror and this is a uh, uh, tin ingot, a huge number. And also, uh, this is the uh, come from Java and also some Buddhist uh, uh, objects. And uh, this kind of uh, pottery kettle is uh, come from Thai. And uh, uh, several hundred of uh, perfume bottle is from the Middle East. And uh, also uh, some uh, uh, this raw material, a ton of this material come from probably from Afghanistan. <coughs> so one could uh, safely conclude that the cargo on the sunken ship was likely to be loaded at one port, and it was most uh, probably in uh, Palembang, because Palembang was then to uh, to trading interport for ship come from Eastern Africa, the Middle East, Western Asia, and uh, Indochina, where ship with uh, cargoes of all ca all kinds all kinds were uh, offloaded and then reloaded with different cargoes before heading for their next destination. If we imagine this ship will take uh, all kind of things from their origin produced place, it, it has to stop, stop for more than 10 parts in different place, then go to the last destination. It's, uh, il um, it's uh, unlogical. The maritime trade uh, around the Indian Ocean during the period from the 9th to 10th century can be uh, grounded into the three trading circle. Srivijaya was the central of the interchange for the first and the second trade road. And uh, uh, their cargoes from different parts of the world were unloaded, uh, traders transacted, uh, transacted uh, their business ships were loaded and uh, uh, with the new cargoes and then caused the right monsoon to head home. So this is uh, the, the conclusion. So uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Srivijaya and also Basra is the most important two interports during that period, 9th to 10th century, uh, for the uh, trade circle from the Southern China Sea to the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, now I would like to add two points of view. The first one is the most prosperity time for the Sri Vijaya is from 890 to 990. Because uh, uh, before eight, 890, Guangzhou Canton is also another very important center for the trade. Uh, during 890, uh, the Huang Chao Rebellion attacked the Guangzhou and they killed 100,000 foreign traders. So the scholars say that is a massacre. So after then, the Persian and Arabic merchants moved to Srivijaya. And uh, uh, in 990, the the, the country in uh, the kingdom in Java, in Chinese we say Madalang Kingdom, have the war with the Sri Vijaya. And uh, uh, in 990, they attacked the, uh, they, they occupied the, the, the Malacca Strait. So uh, this is the first point of view. So before 890, Guangzhou is also very important interport even if in the end of the trade road. It's also very important. And uh, the second point of view is uh, after 990, uh, that, uh, from uh, 11th century to 12th century, is a very low period of the Chinese export posting. During that time, wipes of the Malacca Strait, very few of Chinese posting being found until the end of uh, 12th century. Thank you.